Uh, so, um, it's with great pleasure I introduce uh, Tracy Treko, um, who's going to be talking about connecting DT to maths in primary school. Um, I will also just say a few things about Tracy. Um, so, Tracy is um, an accredited facilitator in digital, digital technologies uh, and local curriculum. He's the founder of uh, education consultancy Blend Learning New Zealand. And she uh, has a vision to make every teacher feel confident in delivering quality, innovative learning. Um, she has uh, over 20 years experience of teaching um, and she's really into enhancing and deepening learning um, through critical and creative thinking, which is, I think, a hope for all of us that our teachers, um, our students and us um, have and inspire everyone to have. So that's enough of me babbling. I will hand over to Tracy. Thank you. Thanks, Tracy, for that um, very kind introduction. Um, and today, as Reese has mentioned, we're just going to get into um, linking through digital technologies through to the maths curriculum. I'm just going to start sharing my screen of our, our presentation. So today we're talking about digital digits. So welcome everyone. I'm talking to you from Auckland. Um, and as I said, we're going to be linking through the digital technologies um, area, uh, particularly around computational thinking uh, and the New Zealand maths curriculum. Um, we're going to be focusing on some of those words there like decomposition, algorithms, debugging and pattern recognition. Um, and if you are thinking, gosh, I'm a little bit daunted by those words, um, hopefully by the end of the session, you're going to, um, together with everyone else, have that a little bit demystified for you. Um, as Reese mentioned, uh, there's a short URL for you to access the presentation uh, in the chat. Um, and down the bottom there, you'll see that um, my contact details are there. Um, I have a consultancy called Blend Learning New Zealand uh, and we work alongside teachers and students in terms of delivering the digital technology in authentic context within classrooms. So um, I've sort of had to approach this presentation as a cater to the masses um, because of the time frame and the number of people participating. So feel free to contact me through um, that contact there uh, if you've got any specific questions in the days to come around digital technology or you wanna get in touch uh, about PLD for your school, depending on where your journey is with digital technology. Okay, let's get into uh, today's mahi. Um, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to unpack the progress outcome uh, for computational thinking, uh, for digital technology. Uh, once we unpack that, uh, we'll be um, starting to look at those terms of decomposition, algorithmic thinking, and pattern recognition. Uh, and what I hopefully will do for you is to try and link that through to the New Zealand mass curriculum. Um, the progress outcome one is very uh, unplugged. So we won't be looking at using digital devices, which is great. Uh, but as we move on to unpack progress outcome two and three, uh, we will be looking at a computerized platform to do that, to engage students uh, with computational thinking and numeracy. Uh, and we'll be looking at Scratch. If there's any Scratch uh, experts out there, please make themselves known. Uh, but uh, hopefully we can have a little bit of play on a Scratch. Um, and a very big if is the understand and explore binary that will really depend on time, but that's something else that uh, comes through in the progress outcomes that we can link to math. So um, just starting off to give you a bit of background, we can look at the digital technology area. Uh, we're talking about these two strands here uh, that came out a couple of years ago in the technology curriculum. Um, you would have just heard me talking about progress outcomes. Um, progress outcomes are the equivalent of achievement objectives. Um, they are just basically a guide for students uh, and teachers to know what knowledge and skills uh, they should be focusing on at different year levels. 
Um, the area we're going to be concentrating on today is computational thinking for digital technologies. You can find the progress outcomes and exemplars in detail through the uh, TKI technology site, uh, which I've linked through to this graphic. Just through there. So let's get into um, progress outcome one. Now, like achievement objectives, progress outcomes uh, sort of work on bands um, and there's an overlap of years. So if we're looking at progress outcome one, I think it mostly relates to years zero to three. Um, I'm just gonna give you all a moment to read that progress outcome. Um, and I'll read it at the same time. So uh, we can start to see that I've highlighted those key um, sort of words there that we started talking about. Um, and I'm just gonna break those down for you there. Um, most teachers get really excited when they see non-computerized tasks. Um, so we can do this all unplugged. But basically what it's talking about when we say students use their decomposition skills to break down they're going to be breaking down a task or a problem into step-by-step -step instructions. And that is what they're talking about when they're talking about algorithmic thinking, okay? So when we're talking about how do I make a peanut butter sandwich, the students can break that down into a step-by-step -step instructions so someone else can follow those instructions to make a peanut butter sandwich. Um, they give those instructions to someone, which is the end user. And while, I, while that person is making that peanut butter sandwich, uh, they have to identify if there's any errors uh, in the way that they have stepped out those instructions. Um, and those errors are called bugs and uh, they need to correct them if there are any errors and that's called debugging. So those are the key um, sort of jargon words used in the progress outcome one. And if we actually get to grips with the fundamentals of that, those key concepts, we will be able to um, understand all the progress outcomes because basically as we progress along the progress outcomes, we just build in terms of sophistication, but the concepts, the foundation concepts are exactly the same, okay? So let's look at this, um, just sort of get deeper into some of those concepts like decomposition. Um, and feel free to put your ideas into the chat uh, as we're going. But my main question is, how do you think decomposition relates to maths? And if I just reiterate that decomposition is the breaking down of a big problem into small management, manageable parts, right? So, if we're looking at it in terms of mass, we're just breaking it down a mass problem to solve. So we can solve simple to complex equations. So something as simple as five plus six, we know that the input is five, the function is the addition, we've got another input of six, um, and then we need an output. So the minute we're looking at a simple mass equation, we are actually doing decomposition, okay? Um, when we start looking at more um, sort of explicit algorithmic thinking, things like cube mass or bed mass, uh, that's where someone has given us an algorithm and we're following it to break down the problem into smaller manageable parts. Okay, so as, as long as we're being explicit with the students that they're actually um, going through a process of decomposition here, this is how we can relate general math to the digital technology um, area, okay? Um, as well as this, the minute students start putting things in order or sequencing everyday tasks, they will be able to um, link that math through to decomposition. Um, you'll see that at the bottom of all my slides that I've put some a New Zealand math link there so that when you're doing your planning, you know where you can link it through to the curriculum. Okay, 
So now that we know how we can uh, decompose a problem, uh, we can get into that algorithmic thinking in a more explicit way. So remember algorithmic thinking is about writing step-by-step -step instructions to solve a problem. And the easiest way I found to do this with students is to use a grid. Um, so we can place characters on a grid. Uh, I need to get my character from A to B point, and I can use position and orientation and mass to do this. And then I can write an algorithm uh, based on my problem that I need to solve. So this was a little video that I did um, for students while we were in lockdown on writing algorithms. So I'm just going to play you the video now. Today we're going to learn about writing algorithms. Remember that an algorithm is a set of instructions to solve a problem. Instructions have to go step by step. Today we're going to learn how to write an algorithm using numbers and symbols. And in this case, the symbols are going to be arrows. Across this grid, we need to get the rocket to fly to the moon, then pick up the alien and return to the Earth which means the symbols that we're going to use, which are arrows, the rocket could either go up, down, left, or right. Next thing we need to decide to solve this problem and write our algorithm is to decide which way the rocket is going to go. The rocket could go this way. Or the rocket could go this way. There is no right or wrong answer of which way to go. You need to decide which way you're going to go and which way looks like the fastest way. I'm going to decide to go this way. The first thing we need to know is what is the first instruction we're going to give the rocket. As you can see, the rocket has gone right first. So let's count up how many squares it has gone right. One, two, three. So we go three, right. Okay. Now to get to the moon, we need to go one up. So let's write one arrow. Now to get to the alien, we need to go one more up. So up, and now one, two, left. That's two, left. Now I'm just going to stop that one there. So I think you've all got the idea that coming there. Um, and so as we go through, we can write an algorithmic sentence, as you can see here on my slides, of what it was to get the rocket, to get to the alien, to get to the moon, then the alien and get to Earth. Um, a key aspect of that is then to test that algorithm and go back and get someone else, which is your end user, to follow your instructions and read those arrows and then and then see if they can follow the instructions to get uh, to the end result. Um, that's your testing and your debugging um, if you need to fix any errors along the way. Now, although we talked about um, this being a year zero to three sort of area that we're uh, looking at, um, you can see that over here, I've done a grid here that I've used with year seven and eights a uh, number of times uh, for them to write algorithms. Obviously, uh, it's more sophisticated in terms of the number of obstacles they need to avoid and the number of things that they need to get. But also, we start talking about, okay, well, we need to put in uh, instructions around, um, you know, turning uh, and angles and how many degrees turn do the 
does the Pac-Man need to go in order to chomp that fruit? So year seven and eights can actually get quite into this and it's quite relevant for them, particularly if they've never done any kind of computational thinking previously. Um, you can also do it in a 3D model, so just like here, um, and there's an example uh, link there called KidBot where students can become robots and other students need to give them instructions to move around the grid. Okay, just following on from that, um, we've already started to talk about uh, some of the concepts around computational thinking, such as algorithms and decomposition. Um, it's really important to note that the approaches of computational thinking are really important um, for students. You're going to find that um, some, most students are going to love this process um, when they're deep in that learning pit. Uh, but there's going to be a lot of students that need to understand, you know, that persevering and collaborating to solve those problems when they have to go back and test and debug and test again and debug again uh, is going to get them um, feeling quite frustrated. So collaboration is the key there uh, and getting them to persevere out of that um, learning pit is really important. Okay. I'm just going to uh, finish this half of the session with talking about um, pattern recognition. Uh, pattern recognition is not something that is explicitly uh, mentioned in that progress outcome, but it is a really important foundation of uh, algorithmic thinking. Uh, as we move through the progress outcomes, you're going to see it come out uh, and it's called iteration or loops, uh, where it's, they're seeing patterns and basically the whole idea is that we want to see patterns in our algorithms because we want to see if we can make them more efficient to solve the problem. So uh, most younger students will start to, across that grid, be talking about an up, up, up uh, instruction and they need to start seeing patterns around that that means three up so that we can become more efficient in terms of our uh, algorithm to solve the problem. So any work that you do around uh, pattern recognition uh, is really important uh, in terms of um, laying that foundation around what is the best algorithm and what is the fastest one. Right, I'm just gonna um, stop there because that sort of covers off the progress outcome one and some of those key fundamentals. And I just, um, looking for any questions that are out there that I can clarify you about those um, fundamental basics. And I'll just get the chat up. And I've got a question here from Lindy about partitioning of numbers. Lindy, do you want to just expand on that question there? Oh, yeah, sorry, I was just answering when you said how does decom decomposition oh, connect? Right. connect? Um, so partitioning of numbers would be decomposing numbers. Yeah, great, thank you for that. Just running through, Reese, did you see, mention, see any other questions that have come through? No, I didn't, no, just that one comment and people Saying hi, whatever. Right, okay. Um, right, I'll just carry on then. Feel free to add your questions as we go. So, hopefully, um, this is useful as we're going through there. Um, okay, so following on, we're going to get into uh, progress outcome two. So, I'll just give you an, another moment to have a quick read of that progress outcome. So as you can see, uh, what I was talking about before is that it's really based on those same fundamentals. So it's just the next step up. We're talking about moving to a more computerized uh, context as well as non-computerized, but we're still talking about that um, idea of students giving 
following and debugging simple al algorithms, which are your set of instructions. The minute you take the set of instructions, like we did on that grid, uh, where we wrote, you know, the arrows and the numbers, and you take that set of instructions and you put it into a computerized context, it becomes what they call a program. And when it's in a computerized context, the program has an output because we can see our algorithm in action. Okay. Um, the best age appropriate environment to do this um, for students at this age level is Scratch Junior from uh, my experience. So as you can see here, um, Scratch Junior allows you to kind of do that next step up, but still have a grid. So you can um, match this through and link this through position and orientation. Um, I always talk to the students about a cat being the robot, but in Scratch Junior you can have a cat or any other character. Um, and he's a robot and he can only do what I tell him to do. So I need to give him instructions to do this. Um, so in the context of, um, of what they were learning, which was around recycling, uh, they popped in these little uh, products that they needed to take to the recycling center and their challenge was to move the scratch cat around the grid to pick up their recycling and take it to the recycling center. So as you can see here, the, the premise is the same, unplugged to plugged. We're just creating an algorithm for that cat to move around the grid so that he can get to where he needs to go. Um, so in that manner, Scratch Junior is just a, a great tool for this. Um, so we start with that sort of thing and then we can end up with a bit more of a um, animation. And here's an example that I've linked here of um, students learning about the kiwi and what the kiwi eats. Uh, and then they create a little animation around that. And I'll just click through there so you can have a look. If you're not sure what that is, it's meant to be a worm and he's eating it. <laughs> and he's off to, he's off into his burrow in the tree. Right, I'll just stop that there. Okay. So, um, Scratch Junior is a great um, platform for the, that year level and for Progress Outcome 2, we're looking at that years two to five. And like I say, that's, that's that overlap that's happening there. Okay. Just have a look at the time. Yep, going well. So moving on to Progress Outcome 3, uh, which will look at years four to seven. Uh, when you're reading this, you're going to sort of start to think to yourself that you're quite the experts now in, um, in computational thinking uh, because you're going to see all those words that we've just talked about and really it just becomes a little bit more sophisticated. So students are still decomposing problems using step-by-step -step instructions and they're debugging things. So here is linked an example of um, how I've used Scratch, which is uh, a web tool, uh, which is free for teachers to sign up to. You can create your class on it. You can invite students in. The students had been learning about area and perimeter in maths, uh, and this was their next um, step for them. So we were using Scratch to create uh, squares uh, with certain areas and certain perimeters. Uh, and as you can see here, this is the algorithm that they use to create these squares. So they had to decompose the problem. The problem is I need to create a square. I need to put through some step-by-step -step instructions to create an algorithm. Um, and I need to predict the kind of behavior that's happening. As you can see here, this is where that word iteration comes in, uh, which is your repeating pattern. Uh, and they needed to start seeing that repeating pattern in here to be able to do it quickly. Um, and uh, there was a lot of debugging that happened uh, during that process, obviously. I'm just gonna click through here um, 
so that you can see our end result. And hopefully uh, we're going to get on to Scratch in the last um, sort of five or so minutes that we've got and learn how to do this. So I'll just press the flag. So there's my square and we gave them the challenge. Okay, well, now you need to do a square that's double the area. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to go into the create function here so we can learn how to do this. Um, so there's my scratch cat, my robot cat. Um, I can move him around, but I really need to give him some instruction in here to be able to um, tell him what to do. So the first thing I've got to do is actually get that backdrop happening off um, the grid. So I can go into backdrops and down the bottom here. Oh, that was not what I wanted to press on. <laughs> Uh, down the bottom here, we've got a 20 and a 30 grid. So uh, if you're starting off with students, I found the 20 uh, the better one to use because obviously um, they have to know their multipliers by 20, 20s or 30s. Um, I'm just going to make the cat a little bit smaller. Um, and as I always say to the students, we should always have a ready, set, go flag to start us off. Um, as you can see down here, the left hand side of Scratch, uh, we can sort of tell what kind of instructions we can give them based on motion or looks or sound. Um, and this was a great way to introduce coordinates to the students, because as you can see, as I move the cat around, the X, Y coordinates change on the grid. So right there in the middle is about the zero to zero coordinates. So the first thing I want to do is actually get my cat to zero and zero. Um, and then I need to start thinking about how I'm going to make the square. So I want to do a three by three square. Um, and so I need to think in terms of 20 because every square is 20. So I'm going to go up here and start to go, okay, if I'm going 60 and zero, and now I can test it with the green flag and see if I've actually gone the right way. Oh, that's went along the X axis. And this is where all this learning for students can come in. Okay, I'm going to go that way. Um, and now I'm going to go 60 by 60. And this is where the pattern recognition comes in um, so that they can start to see how they can actually create this. So let's press the green flag and test that out. Yes, I made a square. And now if you actually wanted to draw the square, there is this function just at the bottom there, which is called a pen, which you can activate. Um, and this is always really interesting um, to ask students, well, where do you think I should start putting my pen down? Um, because most of them will decide there. But actually, I want the pen to go down here before I start drawing my square and I need the pen to go up here. So let's have a look at that one and test it for bugs. Okay, and I might want to actually change my pen size so it's much bigger and go again. And there you have it, your square. So we gave them quite a lot of different challenges around that. 
um, in terms of looking at um, doubling the area of the square or creating different shapes with the same perimeter um, or creating um, you know, shapes that had the same area and the same perimeter. So it's a great, it's a great one. And as you can see, um, you're linking through all those math links as well as all those computational thinking uh, concepts. Um, a great, um, another tool to use when you're looking at 3D shapes um, is Tinkercad. Um, and uh, that's a, a great one for looking at those computational thinking skills as well. I'm just going to stop there uh, for the moment and just check in the chat um, if there was any questions around um, Scratch. Uh, feel free to ask. Just have a look. No questions of yet. Okay. We were going to stop for question time at this stage, but I think we'll just carry on for a little bit longer, seeing so there's not, not much, not many questions there. Yes, Scratch is free. Thank you, um, Stephen. Uh, Scratch is free. Uh, when you Google Scratch, um, uh, you'll get to the Scratch page um, and anyone can sign up to there. But if you want your students to sign up to a class account, make sure you Google Scratch teacher account. Um, and and that way you'll be able to get an educator account and invite students in because you do have to ha be um, uh, be 13 if you sign up to the Scratch account, but you can have an educator account and you can scratch up for free. Um, thank you, um, Julie, who asked, why is it 60? Um, and Michelle, who answered, because each square is worth 20. Um, yeah, so if you use the 20 grid, each square will be worth 20, so you times the area the, the number of squares by 20. Uh, there is a 30 grid, so you times it by 30. And as I said, I tried the 30 grid with some students and um, that was just a little too tricky for them. <laughs> okay. Right, I'm just gonna carry on um, so that we can get um, through binary digits quickly. Uh, I'm just going to sort of glance over that. The um, computational thinking progress outcome three um, is the last bit of it that I didn't put up there is about understanding binary. Um, so students need to understand that digital devices store data um, that are just represented in that two states. And so we just need to start understanding and do some investigation around binary. So it's that idea that we have a denary system which has 10 numbers, including the zero, uh, but a binary system has two numbers. So that's a one and the zero. Um, and that's actually, which blows most people's mind, that everything that is stored on a computer, whether it be pictures, numbers, movies, and everything is stored in binary and that's how a computer actually stores this information um, and the bit or binary digit is actually in a computer represented by a transistor which is either on or off um, and so when it's on it is represented by the number one and when it's off it's represented by the number zero okay so when I'm doing binary, it's easy, really easy to link this to math. So if we're looking at this set of numbers here, or cards of numbers, uh, in my five-bit computer simulation, uh, who wants to guess, to guess for me what card is going to appear here, if I was to carry on? Anyone see that pattern? Yeah, 32, awesome. So um, students will be able to see that pattern as well. So what we're saying is that each one of these is a bit and each bit represents the number of dots on the card, okay? So if we're looking over here, um, so if we choose a number, and I'm just gonna get out of there for a minute. If we choose a number between one and 31, and I'm gonna remove that 24. Um, and can someone give me a number to choose between 1 and 31? 
Okay, 19. Okay. So, and if you're wondering why 31, 31 will be the highest number that we can make out of all of these cards if we added them all up together. Yeah, 16 plus 8 plus 4 plus 2 plus 1. Okay, so 19, we're trying to make 19. So I always start at the highest number, which is 16, and think to myself as a computer, do I need it on or off? Well, yeah, I need it on, so I'm going to leave it on. And then, do I need eight on? Um, no, I can't make 19 with 16 plus eight, so I've got to turn it off. Um, and then, do I need four on? No, nope, because that will be too much, so I've got to turn it off. And two, 16, 17, 18, yes, I need it on. And one, yes, I need it on. So we have made the number 19. So in binary, that would be on, so that's a one. That would be off, so that's a zero, and that's a zero, that's a one, and that's a one. Okay, so my denary number is 19, my binary is 10011. I, I hope you're all amazed by that, because I love it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so now you can see I've got my binary and I can convert it to denary. So here's my binary, which is 01011. Uh, who's the quickest to tell me what that number is in denary? Eleven from Angela. Well done, Angela. <laughs> awesome. So yeah, we add up the eight, nine, ten, eleven. So this is a five-bit uh, computer simulation. Um, obviously, you can add any number of bits, so it becomes more complex for the older students. Um, I've done, even though it's a progress outcome three for binary, um, I've actually done binary with new entrants. Um, you know, with two or three bits and they love it. And it's great for your basic facts and, and seeing those patterns with numbers. I have put in uh, your links if you wanna find out more about binary because um, I really haven't had much time to spend on it. Um, and also um, I made this um, mini inquiry board uh, for students while we were in lockdown. And if you follow through with this uh, with your students, uh, you'd be able to um, become an expert in binary and it's and it's a super fun way of doing it. Um, and so I'm just going to end there. We've got four minutes to the end of the session. Um, so any time for any last questions uh, and just to reiterate, if you want to follow me on Twitter, that would be awesome. I'm, I'm usually trying to put um, things up there of what I'm doing in schools and some really hands-on activities. Um, and yeah, feel free to contact me if you're looking to, to learn a bit more about what we've talked about today. So I'll just have a quick look for any other questions. There was a question asking, uh, do you know what the costs are for signing up for a class at Pams? Oh, it's completely free. Yeah, so Scratch, just, just Google Scratch Educator. Uh, it takes about, you fill out the form, it takes about 48 hours for them to process it, but it's completely free. You can add your students, no problem. So if you're looking for the link to the presentation, it was right, is right at the top of the chat. Um, so thanks everyone for, for coming in and, and, and being part of this. I'll just say, did you see that question, Tracy? Do you do binary arithmetic? I have done binary arithmetic. Okay. Oh, yeah. Well done, Adele. Awesome. Okay, um, is it all right if I just share some final slides and, and, and then- Yeah, yeah. It? Awesome, awesome. Well, um, thanks, Tracy. That was- um, Amazing, really creative, um, engaging, um, really like the platforms you showed us about decomposing problems and creating algorithms. 
Um, I love it when you show things like this. You almost feel like it's magical as a master, and you're like, "Wow, this is this is actually really those hooks that you know will really um, hook some of those those students in, which is great." 